Hello friends, this is Kara Renee with Be Reborn Art and Healing coming to you with part three of the Altoid Mini, the Altoid Tin Mini Journal Cottage Charm. Um, I am doing a voiceover because I've got to tell you like right from the get-go, this was something else for me to do. So it was about an hour and 45 minutes of real-time footage and I had to do something to rectify that so I will be um, obviously doing a voiceover and I have sped up parts of the video and slowed other parts down. What you will notice is there is a lot of talking hands so I will try to explain as best I can and I hope that's not too distracting for you. It was just way crazy. So uh, I wasn't really in a great space to start this today, but I did it and uh, I definitely felt the effects of not being quite on my game. So what I'm doing here is just showing you the bits that I'm using. This is some chipboard from Creative Expressions, a great place to buy thin chipboard if you're interested. I've got some other bits here that I'll be using to build an assemblage on the top of the tin. I've pulled out this vine, these two vines, one being purple tones and the other being pink. And uh, you'll see as we go along what we end up using. Uh, it, it was, there were many challenges along the way, but as I've mentioned before, my commitment to you is to bring you unfiltered um, kind of humanity here in my creative journey. Sometimes our creativity flows very, very easily and other times it does not. Today was one of those that it did not. So I had sort of a plan, but I didn't have it fully planned out and that created quite a problem. Here I'm just showing you a little bit of an idea of what I plan on doing with the um, bit that's going to go on the top of the tin. So I have that little bit of uh, leaves that I showed you a moment ago from the, that's the chipboard, and then a couple of um, old pieces of chipboard that are um, brick, that are shaped like bricks and have the brick indentations, as well as that frame is um, something that I just pulled from my stash that had been previously um, probably attempted for another project and I didn't end up using it. So again here just playing around a little bit with a potential comp uh, composition. Um, but this will change. Uh, it doesn't change a lot, but we do um, have a little bit of vari variations as we move through the project. So I will be using my Deco Art Crackle Paint on the tin itself. So on the lid, on the sides, and on the bottom. And I'll talk about that from here, uh, here and there throughout the video, just to kind of keep you abreast of what I'm thinking. Again, talking hands are at work <laughs> here, which is one of the things that I don't like about kind of an unintentional voiceover because there's a lot of talking hands and no voice. <laughs> so what I'm doing here is I took my sand block out of my drawer, hoping to kind of sand down uh, some of the edges because the tin was not opening and closing properly. It was, I believe that the gesso application that I had done previously um, off video was just too thick and so the tin was having trouble opening and closing. So I'm trying it there with the sand block. I do end up having to come in with a piece of sandpaper um, to work that a little bit more. So um, it was catching on um, those little metal bits there, the divots that um, hook it to the, or make it connect to the lid so it doesn't fall open, um, but that was sort of problematic. So we, um, this process is a very back and forth kind of dance that we're gonna do between working on the tin and working on the embellishments. So I'm gonna start here by giving a coat of white gesso to all of the pieces. I'm giving another coat on the inside of the tin. Probably was overkill because one, one uh, consistent layer of gesso is enough to, um, to do this, basically what the gesso does in this case is it creates a, a um, some tooth to the surface, whatever surface that you are using um, and that you're going to be using other mediums on. So in this case, it was metal. So it was really important that I got a good layer of gesso so that my paints would stick to it. And so I didn't really need to go overboard with my gesso, but I was in that space and I just wanted to be very sure that it was going to be okay. So I'm also going over all of the other bits that I showed you a moment ago 
Um, I'm not going to use all of those leaves because there's just a lot, um, but I thought, well, I've got them out. I'll stick them in my a little um, trinket basket here that I keep close close by and I can use them on something else. So I thought I'm just gonna go with it. Maybe I'll wanna, maybe I won't. Um, but you'll see again as the video progresses what we end up doing. So um, yeah, so this was, this was, it was very fun, but I haven't done this kind of an assemblage in a while. Uh, and there I was just uh, showing off my nails a little bit and I've been doing a lot of mixed media and getting very messy and my nails just come off clean. The finish doesn't come off. It's epic. So I went back to my acrylic nails and I'm so happy with that. So I'm um, just giving that a quick heat, uh, a quick dry so that um, I can put on another layer of gesso. And one of the benefits of, of drying it with a heat tool is it actually warms up the first layer of gesso and it makes it even better when I put the second layer on the gesso sticks better I don't know what the science is behind that I just know that it works so you're gonna see it's gonna take less gesso to put that second coat on so those are all ready um, they're already gessoed they're ready for other mediums I also wanted to mention that the reason why we gesso the chipboard in particular is because it is basically compressed cardboard and so if you don't gesso it whatever wet mediums you're using is just going to soak into the cardboard so you'll end up using a lot more product and it can distort the shape of your chipboard so just you want to tuck that away uh, for uh, later use if, if you uh, find that helpful so we're going to go ahead and flip back to the tin i did find a piece of sandpaper and i'm going to go ahead and sand those edges again i need that tin to open and close without any restrictions and this did the trick so um, this was this is very challenging working with a tin i've done it before but it's been a long time because you can only work on parts of it at a time so maybe you're working on the front and back and then you're working on the center and then you have to go back and deal with the closure parts and the hinges and those kinds of things so it was definitely quite a challenge for me especially in this kind of um I don't know just this place that I'm in that I'm not I'm not really quite with it so got a lot on my mind but uh, anyway um, and I'm pulling out the journal this is what we've done already um, in um, episode or in part one and part two which you should have already seen and I'm just kind of looking kind of reminding myself of the colors and things that are in the digitals um, and what I want to do as my base color for the tin so um, so that's just yeah because obviously I want it to kind of match <laughs> if possible I loved the contrast that we ended up with I did not uh, really intend to use um, yellow, which is what I'm reaching for here. I'm using a medium yellow in my golden fluid acrylic. And so I'm grabbing that now and getting ready to use it. Uh, the other the the other part of mixed media the nature of it is it's seems like it's a constantly changing thing like you discover oh this isn't working and this is working and so there's a lot of reaching and grabbing for other supplies which can make the video be somewhat disjointed so I'm also going to be using my Finnebear um, Finnebear paper texture paste and so um, we're going to start though with the deco art crackle paint all over the top of the oh I'm so sorry I forgot that I brought these out um, because I had a question on one of my last videos my mixed media 101 video episode one where I used the paper paste and I had a viewer ask how it ended up how that paper paste worked it was great it dried hard but it did blur out I don't know if you can see that there in that um, that bit but it did blur out and I think it's just because it's really soft the composition of it is very soft so but it felt like to touch it it felt like sandpaper so it was definitely it's definitely a go it's definitely usable for using through a stencil I guess is what I'm getting at so again we're going to start with a, um, a layer of some crackle paint on the top and on the bite I do end up doing it on the bottom and as well as the sides but I'm going to go ahead and let you watch this part for just a few moments and I'll come back to you when I feel like there's something useful that I can add
in there, I'm just pointing out that I do have to be cognizant of that um, upper lip on the tin because I don't want to get that texture too close to where that lid is going to close because otherwise I'm going to have a problem of a different kind than I've already experienced. So that's just something to keep in mind is making sure that the clearance for um, closures and things like that are going to work with what you're doing. Otherwise you can have kind of a, a bad surprise and it's it can be hard to resolve. Often you would have to like scrape that off and then um, depending on how far you went before you discovered it, you might have a, a problem that's not um, fixable. So um, that's just a, a little tip um, to be thinking about all the parts if you can. Play around with this though because it is it is tricky. It's very different kind of art and very different kind of medium. So, um, but do play. It's fun. I'm not at all sure what I was talking about there with my hands. I think I was um, explaining that I didn't need to dry the crackle paint because I like how texture paste and other things kind of um, blend together um, even you know when they're wet. So I'm just coming over with a light hand. I apologize that first part is off screen. I was really in the zone. So um, bringing it over for you to see and just again um, using a light coat of that text that paper paste. It's really fluffy very it almost looks like snow like it would be a great product if you were going to do some kind of a snow scene or whatever but um, so just applying that right on top of that wet crackle paint and then we'll make sure that this these um, bits get nice and dry before we um, go on. So I'm going to let you continue to watch with some music. Just going to set that aside and go ahead and bring over the little embellishment pieces, the chipboard and the frame. And we're going to start um, thinking about how we're going to paint those and what we want that to look like. So I'm going to talk, talk. Oh, I guess we needed to give it, I wanted to make sure it was nice and dry. That's why I took a moment to go ahead and use the heat tool. And then just pulling those off, making sure they're not sticking to that parchment paper because um, they do stick. Not sure what I was doing there, you guys. I am so incredibly sorry. <laughs> that was a, a bad, a bad uh, part of my editing there, but I am not going to go back and fix that, so I hope that you'll bear with me. Here's just a close-up, a little bit slower, uh, so that you can see the bits that are the texture, the paper paste, and what is the crackle paint. Um, but that's going to, you're going to get several opportunities to see that as we move through this. So I pulled out some other paints, uh, some green. This is Sap Green from DecoArt Premium Paints. And I've got my golden green gold fluid acrylic. And that's what we're going to use on the lids. On the lids, oh my goodness, on the leaves. Um, and we're going to use the raw umber fluid acrylic for the frame and the uh, chipboard, the, the brick, excuse me. Boy, my, my brain is just on vacation or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, we all have times like that, and, and I, I've made a commitment to my viewers to not just show the pretty top side of my creative process. I'm going to show you all of it. And sometimes it doesn't go well, and sometimes it doesn't flow well, and sometimes it's not linear. And... I, my commitment to you is to not cut that stuff out. Now, I do um, speed some stuff up uh, in this video because some of it is just so stinking repetitive that I don't want you to like get frustrated or fall asleep or whatever. I'm leaving the errors in and showing you how I fix them, but speeding up and, um, and removing some of the repetitive actions. So I hope that makes sense, but uh, we all, no matter, I don't know, I don't, 
doesn't matter what kind of artist you are, how um, experienced you are, how much you've done. We all have days where the flow just isn't there. And so I hope that um, you don't mind me leaving in all of that stuff. And um, I'm just being real. I'm just being me. And I'm I'm going to be creative even when I'm not feeling quite in sync with my own self. So um, anyway, I'm going to let you go ahead and watch this part. We will uh, flip over and start using the greens as well. But I'm going to go ahead and set this part to music and let you just enjoy that while you watch. again here just I'm going to go ahead and start working on the leaves so we're going to start with the sap green that's that darker green uh, as a base color and then we'll come in with the green gold which is more of a springy green to create some contrast in the leaves I'm not too concerned about precision here because not much of that's going to show and you will have already probably seen that in the photo at the beginning of the video um, it gets pretty much covered over by um, s some of the other bits. So, but as I've mentioned before in mixed media, there is never anything wasted in terms of layers and process and all of that. So, um, yeah, this is just one of those things that you just kind of follow your gut as to what what it is that you're trying to do see where it goes sometimes it means you have to go a different direction sometimes you have to let go of the picture that you had in your head about what you were going to do because often it's replaced with something better so just want to encourage you there so i'm going to go ahead and let you finish watching And so the heart there, I was trying to figure out what color I would like to uh, paint that with. And so I grabbed my basket of uh, my pinks and reds in my just my craft acrylic. And so I'm looking for a color that is going to kind of match the primary color that is in the pink flowers in the vine. And then I'll come in with a lighter pink um, as, again, that lighter contrast on, the, on that butterfly. So... And this paint, I don't know if it's the brand or what, but it would not, uh, it was just giving me a watery solution. I'm not sure why. So I'm trying to use it, but then I do end up sticking my brush in it and giving it a good stir and getting a little bit of a thicker bit out on my mat to um, try to get a heavier coat because it was just watery. I don't know if you can see how watery that is, but it was not working for me at all. So that's what I'm doing there and 
and here coming in with the green gold again as I mentioned uh, we, we want to bring some contrast to the leaves and so I'm coming in with that lighter kind of spring green I did decide as I was pointing there to the brick chipboard I'm going to come in with a little bit of the green on that and it was actually quite beautiful in the end um, kind of looked or I guess the the idea behind that was just to kind of create like maybe um, the indication of like moss or something on the brick um, but again it it doesn't show a lot in the final product because the vines that we wrap around the frame here in a little bit they do cover a lot of that up and it some of it is a little bit indistinguishable in terms of it being brick um, in the upper left hand corner of the top of the tin you can see that it's brick but the rest of it's a little bit a bit a little bit lost in the layers so and here I'm just using my finger to apply that green gold onto the brick chipboard here. And again, I get this chipboard from Creative Expressions. I haven't bought any in a really long time, but they are a fantastic company. A uh, huge selection of chipboard. It's very, um, it's not so thin that it's not, that it's cheap but it's not so thick that you couldn't actually use it in a journal. I'm going to get mine out because I have quite a bit and start seeing where I can and use those in my use it in my journal since I don't do as much mixed media as I used to. But um, so that's and I'll be sure to link them in the supply list over on my blog. So again, just gave that a quick dry to make sure that um, everything is set well. And I've got this other color. It's, this is an Americana or a deco art paint rather. And it's, I believe it's baby pink. Uh, but anyway, any, any brand, any paint would do. Uh, just again, depending on what your, what your color um, preferences are. I wanted to bring out the pink and the kind of those the pink tones in the flowers that are in the vine that um, we put around the frame. Sorry if I'm repetitive. <laughs> it's just, it's been a day. And they're just showing you the, the lighter green. Not doing a very good job of it though. Oh goodness. But, you know, this is me in the raw, as I say. I'm just going to cap up those paints just to make sure I don't spill them. I'm infamous for spilling paints and inks and all kinds of stuff on my desk. So I'm just going to set that aside and give it a moment to um, have a, a little bit of dry time. And we'll bring the tin back in and work on it a little bit more. It is, I was trying to be really careful to not get a lot of medium, wet medium on it before it was nice and dry. So there's just another close up. I don't know if you guys can see the difference between the paper paste and the crackle paint. Uh, so you can see the cracks and then the fluffier parts are the paper paste, which I love. I love the look. Be awesome in a, in a winter kind of project or scene, a winter journal, that kind of thing. Again, just zapping that again, making sure it's nice and dry. And we're going to go ahead and come in with this uh, golden fluid acrylic. I believe it is yellow medium. And we're going to paint um, all of the top and the bottom of the tin as well as all of the edges. Um, I actually paint the inside of the tin uh, brown uh, with the raw umber off camera at the very end. Um, but you'll be able to see that in the photos um, at the end of the video. I like to take a lot of photos so you guys can see everything, if it, even if it's something that I didn't actually show kind of implicitly in the video. So just giving that a good coat. And there's a challenge there in that crack, right? Because you've got your hinges and you have to make sure that the back of the bottom and the back of the top of the tin don't rub um, and interfere with one another as it's drying. So uh, it's easy to kind of get excited about closing it and going on and doing something else, but uh, you can't do that because it can actually kind of get stuck closed, which is not a good deal. So I'm gonna go ahead and just let you watch this for a little bit.
So now we're going to come in with the my um, kind of traditional raw umber glaze because we've got all this beautiful texture on the surface and unless we do some kind of a contrast we're not going to see all those cracks and we're not going to see all the beautiful peaks and valleys of the paper paste. So coming in with my raw umber fluid acrylic uh, mixed with glazing medium and my uh, I do one part paint to two parts of glazing medium and the beauty of this as I've spoken before in other videos is that you can apply this brown uh, glazing mixture to a, a surface it doesn't matter what surface it is and apply it all over it and then you can wipe it back wipe off the parts of it that you don't want to be as dark so because there's so much texture on this surface the brown is going to be left in all of the cracks of the crackle paint and it's going to highlight all of the texture the peaks and the valleys of the paper paste so that will make a lot more sense as we continue on but it is absolutely stunning so um, you'll be able to see that in a moment so I'm going to let you watch this I do come in with some baby wipes and wipe it back and um, it's it's just it's almost magical I love it I know it can be kind of a gasping moment if you've never seen me do this before because it looks like I'm just kind of destroying this by putting brown paint on it but it's not brown paint it's a brown glaze and so the the nature of the glaze is it allows you to uh, I guess it's just that it's um, it's about I think it's about the drying time really I'll have to kind of do some more research on that so that I can um, add that to my Mixed Media 101 series and talk with you a little bit more about why it does what it does. Um, I'm not very uh, I'm not very informed on that. I just know that it works, but I will see what I can find out for you. Really a little bit tricky there to get into the again into that crack where the hinge is. So yeah it's tough <laughs> um, and in this first swipe I'm kind of more patting and I do start doing a little bit more of just ab ab actually wiping off um, as we move along here I wasn't I just was feeling like the baby wipe was getting caught on the texture and that was a little bit concerning to me but uh, in it in the end it was fine and as long as you've let those mediums dry really really well you don't really have anything to worry about so yeah, it's beautiful. So do you, I don't know if you guys can see that. I'll show you a close up here. Um, see that brown, that raw umber just settled into that crack that was just not deliberately made. It's just gorgeous. Now, again, with this composition, uh, a lot of that we don't see, especially what's on the top of the tin. So you could probably even forego that if you wanted to. Um, but some of it does peek through. So I, it's better, in my opinion, to just do it. Plus, you don't want an uneven texture on the top of the tin because you don't want anything that you're gluing on top of it to kind of be wobbly because it doesn't have the same, um, it doesn't have a level playing field there underneath it. So that's why I just go ahead and do the whole surface and then just deal with, with that um, and knowing that, that we're going to lose some of it. So, But you'll be able to see in the close-up videos that there is some of it that you can see and it's just it's just gorgeous. So I'm just getting a piece of my parchment paper and cutting it down here so that I can put it in between the lid and the tin as I work as we work on the top because I don't want it to I mean it would be a tragedy if I was doing this and I pushed that down without the parchment paper in there and I couldn't get it back open <laughs> especially since this is fairly a new you know medium application so we want to make sure that nothing gets stuck. Um, even now it's been a, a few hours and I still have it propped open because I don't want to take any chances of ruining it and then as as time goes on I will uh, fuss with it and I'll make sure that it opens and closes fine and do whatever I need to do to to make that happen so I've gotten my golden um, matte gel out um, I like to use this to attach heavier embellishments. It's just showing you how many brushes I've already used. Oh my goodness. Um, but it usually works really, really well with three-dimensional objects. But I had just a heck of a time. And this is the part of the video where 
Um, I am going to, in a little while, I do kind of cut out a big chunk of my struggle because it was just a repetitive struggle of trying this glue and trying this glue and trying this glue and pressing it down and all of that stuff. So you'll see that here in just a moment, just kind of giving you a, a heads up there. So I wanted to use this vine, but I realize now after the fact, it probably wasn't the best choice because the reason why I had such such problems with it is because it was really stiff and the flowers would not lay down. So they were just kind of hanging out there and I couldn't get them to lay, or lay flatter. And so that's where my biggest battle in this whole project was. So, but you'll see that as we move along, it turned out beautiful. I wouldn't change a thing, but it was definitely gave me a run for my money. Um, this one did so. I'm going to go ahead and try, the, the first glue I'm going to try is the matte gel. It is an adhesive. It has other uses, but for today it is an adhesive. Again, for heavier, uh, more three-dimensional kinds of objects. So I'm going to, I'm starting with a brush to um, get some of that matte medium out. And then I do end up going to my, using my finger because it was just really hard to get that matte medium um, onto the surface with the brush because it's such a thin um, border there that frame on the back so I'm gonna let you just watch and listen to the music here and I will catch up with you in a moment The, the struggle I was having there is that the, there is some wire in that, in that, um, what did I just call it? Oh my goodness, that vine. And um, it wasn't bending very well. It wasn't very flexible. If I were to do this again, and if you were to try this with similar products in terms of the vine, I would have used some wire and use some wire to kind of bring those flowers in there on the right side so that they're more sitting on top of the frame rather than hanging off the edge of the tin. What I ended up doing worked, but it was it was quite a nightmare. So if you just used a little bit of wire, you'd be able to solve this problem a lot quicker by just wrapping, putting those flowers in place and then wrapping them uh, with a little bit of wire to the frame itself. So there uh, for a moment, I was just showing you that I was being trying to be mindful of the distance that I was putting that from top to bottom and side to side so that it was centered on the top of the tin and just giving that a press with my paper towel. Now I left here, I gotta tell you this story. I was working on this and then I realized I was wanting to go to my granddaughter's softball game, so I had to leave. So I just put these two containers on top of it. I fussed a lot more with the glue, so I tried E6000, I tried matte gel, I tried um, Fabri-Tac, all kinds of things, and it was just a disaster. But as you can see there, I was able to pull those flowers in towards the inside of the tin, uh, the inside of the frame, and they are solid now. Now I'm just gonna work at kind of picking away some of that extra glue. Um, several hours have passed by this point, so I was able to safely do that without risking pulling off um, the flowers themselves. So. Again, if I were to do it again, I would use some wire to attach that vine to the uh, to the frame before I did all this other this other stuff. So, um, and there I'm just seeing white, and I think that that's um, part of the inside of the tin, the lid that has not been painted. Um, but I take care of that again off camera, and I will show that to you in the photos at the end of the video. Just fussing with that glue a little bit more apparently and I will need to touch up I was just getting that paint out showing you because I will have to go in and touch up where that glue has kind of damaged the um, the surface of the frame so and that worked just fine so I do need to try I'm not sure why my chipboard fit before and it doesn't fit now um, but I did have to trim it down 
of both of the pieces. So I'm tucking that larger piece of brick chipboard into the lower right hand corner and I'm going to use just Fabri-Tac because it's just a flat surface and I don't need to worry about, I mean I can give it one press down and it's gonna it's gonna be fine. So I'm just going the easy route and using the Fabri-Tac. I'm gonna do that with both this piece and the the brick chipboard that's going to go in the upper left hand corner as well. Had to try to get around some of that those vines in the lower right hand corner. It's hard to see uh, from your vantage point but it was uh, it was tricky. And then just making sure that that's going to fit. I do need to trim that one. I had to round that a little bit or cut a divot out rather to get it around a piece of the vine that um, is in the way there in the corner. You know, you live and learn, right? <laughs> it was a fun process. I mean, it's been a long time since I've did this kind of mixed media art, so um, it was fun to kind of get dirty again and and uh, and bump into some of the obstacles because I forget what the process is like, and it's it's actually quite enjoyable. So I'm going to go ahead and use one of the uh, leaves that we painted that's got the three leaves with that little squiggly vine. And I'm gonna glue it right in there. Um, I think that, yeah, I turn it around because it's upside down. So it's gonna get glued again right on top of the brick chipboard. So the bottom, as I mentioned earlier, the bottom part of the chipboard, that bigger piece, doesn't show very much of that brick, but you can see it in the close-up photos. Uh, the chipboard in the upper left hand corner does show so it's really quite beautiful a little bit mysterious because you you're like look at it and wondering what's underneath so it was kind of a neat process actually so I did not prepare those flowers so you know I talked in the big well I don't know if I talked because I did it ended up doing a voiceover but that white flower is what I wanted to use but I didn't paint it so I get to this point and I'm like it's not painted I'm not using it so I decided to just grab a couple more of the um, the flowers from that vine and just put them there in the corner kind of nestled in the corner the lower left hand corner of the frame kind of inside and then there was just that tiny little rosebud that you can see on the table that I'm going to also tuck in there. Oh, I grabbed a piece of the leaf too. That wasn't really necessary, but um, I mean, I guess I'm looking at it now and I guess that was a good thing because it does, it just hid a little bit more of the, uh, of what was underneath than I would have probably liked if I'd thought that through a little bit better, but it's all good. It's adorable. I may just I may I may hold on to this one and give it away for my 2000 subscriber giveaway. I had mentioned before that I was going to put potentially make the mixed media fairy journal for the giveaway, but that is a really extensive project and I don't think it's something that I'm going to want to give away. So, I I promise that when we get to 2000s, which is 2000 which is right around the corner that it will be something worth uh, worth waiting for and worth watching for. So I always make my giveaways very, very uh, exciting. So even though it probably won't be a fairy journal, it won't be the fairy journal. Uh, we'll see what I come up with. Maybe I'll maybe I'll just give this away with some other bits to the grand prize winner. So we'll see. That will come. More information will come in the next probably the next couple weeks. We are at almost 1900 right now. So I want to make sure that I'm prepared for that. I just put a little bit of that Fabri-Tac on that little uh, rosebud. It's not even a colored rosebud, it's just the green rosebud. But I thought it was really cute. I was just looking at the purple to see if there was anything else I could pull off of it, but this was fine. And then I, I get this already. I get a stamp out to put a little bit of script on this butterfly. Uh, and then I was gonna intended to glue it on on camera and I didn't so I do that off camera too but you'll be able to see that here in a moment the very end of the video you'll see all of the all of the photos uh, close-ups of what we did here today just using some black archival ink from Ranger to just grab a little bit of a tiny script um, on this stamp and then just putting it right there on the heart just gives it a little bit of visual interest that make it 
stand out a little bit more. And it's going to go right there <laughs> when it gets glued on. And I'm coming in with my glue, uh, my glue, oh my goodness, my gold. This is Golden Fluid Acrylic and Iridescent Gold Fine, one of my favorite things on my desk. And so I'm just um, going to be really struggling with this because it's like, how do you get my big finger in all of those small spaces? Um, I'm going a little bit even over the flowers just so that that gold catches on the tips and I'm going to do a little bit of gold around the edges um, and the bottom and all around the um, tin. So I'm just going to go ahead and let you listen to the music for a little bit and then I'll be back with you. brush just doesn't have the same effect as you can see there if you're watching that I was trying with a tiny brush hoping to be a little bit more careful but it doesn't catch on the surface and catch the texture and the and stuff that with that my finger the same as my finger can so uh, that's why I did that I just went ahead and and tried to get my finger in there a little bit but it's such a tiny little little tin a <laughs> really challenging project we will continue in the next video in part four making some more ephemera and getting the journal a little bit closer to being finished um, just again putting the, the gold um, just letting my finger skip across that surface I'm not using I'm, I'm using a very light hand I was just showing you there we've got some white because I, you probably saw earlier where I set the tin down on its bottom. That was a bad idea. I do fix that. You'll be able to see that in the end. So guys, I hope that you enjoyed the video. I hope that it wasn't too crazy. Uh, sometimes I do that. Um, but thank you so much for stopping by um, and for supporting me. And I hope you learned something and I hope that you go play. Thanks. Bye-bye.